Uh, part of the backdrop to this year's conference is comments about free software lawyering made by people I love and trust and believe in very much who were in a bad mood at the time for some reason. Uh, and so I thought that one of the things we really ought to do today is ask the question, what, what do free software lawyers really do? Uh, the correct way of investigating that question seemed to me to be uh, to go to the people who knew most about that because they had the most experience with it. And that was two sets of people, the lawyers that free software lawyers are inside the companies and the lawyers who work with them, and the clients who, not necessarily being copyleft clients, but clients who have needs uh, and whom we could permit actually to talk about what we do for them in public. That is our most friendly, reliable, discreet, and thoughtful clients. And so Nathan and Steve immediately seem to be the right ones. But, but what is for me the, the, the most charming part of all of this is getting a chance uh, to talk with uh, in your presence here, lawyers I have now worked with uh, since the end of the 20th century when people started caring about this who made money in IT. Uh, Terry Lardy and I are, after all, old IBMers together. I, it's, when I'm, it's, when I, it's when I'm with the people who have stayed that I remember who I was when it, this all began. And, and it's always seemed to me in a way that it was the easiest part of my job uh, relating to the IBM lawyers because I had been a kid in their shop and a programmer in their shop before that and I, I sort of knew how the drill went. Um, but, but, but having the opportunity to ask Terry to come and talk about what free software lawyering is or FOSS lawyering or open source lawyering or whatever Ginny would want you to say about that uh, seemed to me to be the, the best place to start in explaining to any cranky people out there what it is that free software lawyers really do. So, Terry, tell us, what, 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 what have free software lawyers been doing? So, I'll tell you what I do. Um, and I have a feeling a lot of other people are doing this, have been doing the same thing. I, and I've been doing this for going on 17 years. Um, uh, and I certainly haven't been alone in doing it. I've had lots of help, or not help, I've had colleagues, people like Jeff Thompson, been doing it almost as long as I. And actually, I, I have three, uh, I'll refer to them as interns who actually helped me with this. They're sitting there in the audience actually today. Um, what I do though. Um, white, so, shirt, blue, white shirt, blue sweater. It's, a, it's not quite the idea. <laughs> I work for it. Not, okay, it's sorry. not the one you remember. <laughs> uh, so, well, I mean, I'm, particularly at a company like IBM, I'm sure you will we remember this. One of the things that Corporations and IBM in particular really hate. They don't really like to get sued. Um, uh, the, the company hates uh, uncertainty. They like certainty uh, for all sorts of good, sound reasons. So one of our principal jobs and is is to keep the company from getting sued. Uh, and, and that's kind of a draconian way to look at it. But that's really at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is make sure we don't get sued. So how do you do that? Um, well. Compliance, and I don't want to repeat things that uh, Dave, Dave said, but compliance is a big part of it. We've spent a lot of time making sure as best we can, and I am sure there are things that slip through the cracks because developers will do what they want to do, but in the, at the end of the day, I think we have a pretty good control on it. In fact, I have to be honest, I, mean, I know you said you dealt with one large company, which I believe was not IBM, who seemed to have lots of little people running off, lots of little groups running off and doing bad things independent of one another. And that really doesn't happen in IBM. We're a lot more, maybe of course we're a lot more centralized. But when we started to put together programs, um, we really were able to implement them across the company. One of the things that we have learned uh, you know, so one of the things that when, when, when we had our discussion, you talked about solutions at scale. And I have to be honest, when we first started our solution, it did not scale. Uh, we looked at um, every little thing that happened uh, it, that was, auto, you know, that had letters free or OSS or anything on them. And after a while, we were crushed. Uh, by it because the little successes kind of led to more and more people being interested. So we re-engineered our compliance systems. And then we re-engineered them again. And I think we might be in our fifth uh, iteration at this point. I, I've kind of lost track. And each time we've tried to make it a bit more efficient. But compliance 
And what do I mean by compliance? Well, yeah, we do things like scan code. Uh, we have significant questionnaires, which, like I said, my guys in the audience uh, spent a lot of time looking at. Um, and when we have questions, we go back to the developers and we, we figure them out. We, we try and fix them. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of moving things around, but sometimes it's saying you got to do things differently. So we, we have a dialogue, whether they like it or not, with, with the uh, developers. But the other thing I'd have to say is the developers need to be, this is uh, a partnership. Um, in fact, when I say this is a partnership, it's not only a partnership with your own developers, it's a partnership with the communities as well. And one of the things is you need to treat your partners well or the partnership does not last. And I think we've learned that one of the things that IBM has benefited from is having a fairly good level of credibility with the various open source communities that we've engaged with, which is a lot. I mean, hundreds if not thousands at this point. And, and you get there, I think, a couple of ways. One is you respect the rules of the community. Because if not, you're going to lose your credibility real quickly. The other thing is you really do have to contribute back. I mean, you can't just be a taker. You have to be a giver. The free rider problem exists. But I think what we've learned today, and as people have said, is that even people have found it to their benefit to contribute back because it ultimately make, makes things more efficient. And I think that's a lesson that's really been learned at IBM. Um, Somewhat to my surprise, so so I, I spent a lot of my I spent a lot of my time with that. We spent a lot of time with governance, which is really the other side of of compliance. Uh, we and we good do have good governance systems in place. Um, the other things I spend a lot of time, a couple of things. Well, I spend a lot of time doing client counseling, both mainly internally, almost all internally, of course. I spend a lot of time when people walk by on my phone and say, you're always on the phone. That's because I'm always talking to clients, trying to figure out what we can do. Sometimes my clients are the lawyers, sometimes they're, they're the uh, developer groups. But uh, that's actually kind of an interesting part of the job. Uh, I get to pontificate a lot, so it's kind of fun. Um, lines of community. Absolutely not, <laughs> you know. So that, that doesn't happen a lot, so I take advantage of it. Uh, the other thing, I, I, I think, um, I've been very fortunate uh, since I've been in this job because I came into this job at a time when a couple, well, first of all, I've been, I was in the job at the very beginning of when I kind of, my job I actually was the first one in, I, so I guess I created it in a sense. And things have changed radically, uh, extraordinary, to an extent I never would have expected. But one of, the, one of the nice things that I've had in my job is that I've had a lot of time to talk to other groups. Um, I've done literally, I've done a lot of, as it turns out, I've done a lot of education, both uh, for, for different groups. I've done it um, to, I've actually done it in law school, I've done it uh, a lot of professional organizations, and it's nice to get out once in a while. It's also nice to kind of um, help other people do what we think needs to be done. Uh, you know, I, I kind of, you know, um, I guess it was Goethe who said, if everyone sweeps in front of their own door, the whole world will be clean. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, and we all can kind of, you know, it's, it's, her, it's like a herd immunity, I guess, essentially. So I've, I've spent a lot of time with that, and that's, that's very fulfilling. It also what it does, uh, and I've, some of this is like through professional organizations like the AIPLA, for example, it also introduces you to people, other people, like, like people like David. Um, that you get to talk to them and see what they're doing. And that's, that's critical, I think, to understand what other uh, lawyers in the uh, community are doing. So all those have been pieces of my job. Um, and it's, uh, it's been a fascinating ride, actually. Let, let, let me get just a little more technical and close to the bone with you for a couple of moments. I, when, when Terry and I were preparing this, this afternoon, we were reminiscing a little bit about some things. Um, the first... The first compliance issue that I ever had uh, with IBM in this world uh, was a supply chain issue, as it happens. Um, uh, the first time that IBM sold a ThinkPad laptop 
uh, with a free software system on it, a Linux kernel and uh, standard free software user land. Uh, the laptop had a DVD player in it, hardware, and um, so IBM wanted the, the Linux version of the ThinkPad to play DVDs just like the whatever that was that we used to use on laptops. And, 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 and um, uh, they bought a third-party DVD player for the Linux kernel, and it shimmed the kernel in a, a not acceptable way in order to do DVD CSS and maybe some other things too. Uh, and although um, the problem was a kernel problem, and I wasn't the kernel's lawyer, and I wasn't acting on behalf of any particular client at the Free Software Foundation or elsewhere, I thought it was really sort of important to do the first one right. Uh, and so I called. It didn't happen to be Terry. It was Neil Abrams. Uh, and, and I called and I said, you know, this ThinkPad, um, there's a problem. And here's the problem I think there is. And Neil gave me the one true lawyer response. He said, okay, thanks for calling. I'll look into it and get back to you. Uh, and uh, 10 days later, Neil called me up and he said, you're right, there's a problem. We're fixing it. Thanks. Bye. Uh, and that was the first one. Uh, and, and it was because what the first one was was, yeah, we looked into it. Thank you. There's a problem. We're fixing it. Bye. All other problems were then very simple. And pretty soon there weren't any anymore. And so I agree with you that it's an awful lot about how you create trust, not just how you create compliance. And uh, then the second thing that happened uh, was that I, uh, it was uh, early in 2000. Uh, and Terry called me up one day and he said, you know, um, we really need to figure out how to allow uh, some patent claims to go to GCC of ours. Uh, we got some claims and, and we would like the compiler to be okay with them. Uh, and I said, oh, you want to make some patent licenses? And Terry said, oh, no. He said, uh, our patent licenses, he said, they start at 85 pages long, and they're, they're country by country specific, and, and there's no way we ever want to do that. And, and, and so we talked for a little while, and I said, okay, so I think what you want is to make an estoppel, right? And, and, and that's right. And Terry said, well, maybe it's an estoppel or maybe it's a covenant not to sue, which was a subject that came up again in GPL3. And we, McCoy and Terry and I spent months trying to figure out what is the difference between the two of them. Um, and, and, and next thing we knew, we had hammered out a way of doing this, uh, which not only became, of course, the way that IBM released patent claims to GCC, but it became the way the GCC steering committee expected other people to do it too. And here there turned out to be an example of why it was that the free software world would deal on slightly different conceptions because I didn't have to worry about a license. All I needed to be sure was that if anybody ever came and sued us and wanted an injunction, there would be a way to go in and say, no, that, that, you, they can't have an injunction, Judge. We have no revenue for royalties. We're not worried about license. We're just worried about making sure that nobody stops our guys from making the compiler, which would be really bad news for everybody. So if you will stop yourself, we'll be finished. Uh, many years later at a patent intensive company in San Diego, I felt myself having the same conversation because of course it's easier to say, yeah, we're never gonna sue you. We wouldn't mind repeating that into your microphone than to make licenses. What we were really doing was inventing. There's no question that we were inventing. And we were inventing in collaboration across the line between the companies and the communities. And it was, it was pretty easy to do because there were so few of us back then. Yes, that's true. Um, but it wouldn't be so easy now. That is to say, everything has gotten both easier and harder at the same time. Um, how many layers inside IBM would there have been if it hadn't been you on the telephone all the time? It's, it's really important, isn't it, in a way that that knowledge came to be in existence in a few crucial places inside the company? Yeah, I think that's been, that's been helpful. And I certainly won't say I was the only place where the, where the knowledge resided, but I was, you know, I eventually got to the position that when people had a question, they, know, they knew to come to me. And I, we could get things routed quickly. Which wasn't quite like the OSRB open source review board structure <laughs> that we'll be talking about in a minute in other places. It was, it was funny in a way because IBM was, after all, quite institutional, but it didn't institutionalize that in quite this right. form. But, but it took us a few years to get to that sort of level of operation. Uh, I mean, we, we had to socialize this quite a bit. 
And of course, there's always the product managers who um, had their own points of view, I seem to recall. Well, one of the good things that IBM, or some people might not think it's, it's good, is that uh, historically, and maybe this is because we had this, this antitrust uh, history, is that um, the product managers knew that ultimately, they, for a lot of time, they had to talk to the lawyers, whether they wanted to or not. Uh, so they would begrudgingly give us our due. And they would get to us. But we really try hard not to get in their way. I was spoiled by this as a kid lawyer before I went to Cravath because my first job working as a lawyer was working as an IBM lawyer. And I thought that American companies were places where people didn't get promoted if they didn't listen to the lawyers. That, that turned out <laughs> I don't to think be, they're all like yeah, that. Yeah, no, that turned out to be quite wrong <laughs> later on. I got a very bad impression about this at first. But I, I, I think that's right, that the, the long culture of contestation with 12 other companies and the United States government had caused it to be a world in which people really did feel that they needed counseling and they needed to take it. And I do think that affected how IBM adopted open source software. I, it definitely had an influence. I, I, was, I was impressed when we were all together at the 20th anniversary in Vancouver and Dan Fry and Irving Vladowski Berger were talking about how IBM came to the decision about FOSS, and they said, well, you know, we had a task force, and I thought, yes, yeah, the usual IBM task force thing, <laughs> and they said, we got everybody in a room, and we said, is this going to go anywhere, and everybody said, yes, it's going to go everywhere, and we should do it, and it was a very easy task force to have. That, I think, was the other thing that surprised me at the beginning, was how quick IBM got to a consensus about this. It actually surprised me as well, I have to be honest. <laughs> um, it didn't take all that long, but um, when we, I have to be, you know, I'll be honest, when, and I think Scott probably had a somewhat similar experience. When the first time somebody walked into my office with a copy of the GPL, I said, let me read this. And I came back the next day and I said, we can't use this. <laughs> That's probably still true, <laughs> but, what was the, but what was the particular reason at the time, if you can One recall? of our researchers wanted to use a piece of GPL code, and I'm thinking, what is this? This is crazy. But that started a, a long series of conversations. In fact, we, for about, this was even before I officially had my job, for about six months, uh, there was a group of attorneys that would meet um, uh, once a week in what we called steel cage death matches in which we were trying to parse out exactly what we could do and what we couldn't do. In fact, ultimately, we ended up late one Friday, I think it was a Friday evening late in the GC's office, and he was just like saying, okay, well, what do we do? And um, he wasn't real happy about it, but ultimately, we got to a point where we knew what we could do and how to live with it. Uh, Scott, how, how does this sound similar and different? Um, so, so I have a few slides. Yeah, hey. let me, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So I'm going to answer this question by giving a little more more of a historical tour of sorts. So, um, uh, my journey began. It's actually a little like what Terry was saying. I, my journey began actually uh, when others stepped back. So, in 1992, somebody asked me about this document that that Terry was referring to, the GPL. And it was pretty, it, it, I had a pretty strange reaction to it. Um, it was probably, I think, about the, relating to uh, the use of the tool chain, some uh, GCC and some other of uh, the GNU tools. Um, in any case, um, after other lawyers at HP learned that I had read this document, then every question relating to this kind of a funky document came to me. Okay, and so this was the image of, I have this idea that you, everybody's seen the scene where there's the, the officer in front and this line of soldiers, and, and it describes this really difficult outing. And, okay, I'd like to have a volunteer. And everyone steps back except for this guy. I'm the guy. <laughs> I didn't step back. And it turns out that um, uh, this, so that, and for people in this audience, you may not realize there was a time before free software was a thing in commercial products, right? There was a time when in commercial products, free software was not a thing. This was, this was the time period that I'm talking about. But starting in, say, 99 or something like that, I had now already had a number of these questions. So by the time it became a thing, 
at Hewlett Packard. So, so the slides here show I'm, I'm from Red Hat at the moment, but the time period I'm talking about, I was, I was at Hewlett Packard, uh, kind of a diversified computing, computing company for those who, the two or three who may not have heard about it. I don't know. Um, By the way, what's that at the moment stuff? Hey, hey, there we go. And there we go. I have made this amazing move to Red Hat. So, um, and so at that time, uh, open, when open source wasn't a thing in, in, the in the 90s, and then I got a few questions. So then by the time it came along, I happened to be that guy who was standing there and, and had uh, been answering questions. And so that began um, my journey, so to speak, of uh, free software lawyering. And one of the things that I, um, learned early on, and I think actually, so at that turn of the tide, so to speak, 1999 was, uh, there was this O'Reilly book published, um, Open Sources, Voice from the Open Source, you know, Chris, uh, Chris DeBono, actually Chris was one of the editors, I don't know who, who, how many people know Chris, so I, 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 from HP I went to Google and, and I spent five years working with, with Chris there. Um, that turns out to have been in retrospect a really interesting and, and important book in a certain sense because it's a bunch of essays by different people and it, it, it wasn't a book about free software, it was a book by people about their experience. And that is really, that is so important to appreciate that you don't like pick up a textbook or something and say this is the way free software lies. No, 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 no. It, it, this is a world where the license is a piece of a world that involves people, and understanding that dynamic is, is really important. So this slide, context matters, reading the license is not enough. So many lawyers, they approach things, they've gone to law school, they, they understand it, how to read contracts and so forth, and they read licenses in the same way, and, and they apply that, that legal analysis with free software, you really have to appreciate the context. It really, it really matters. The license plays a role in a, um, uh, a larger process. And if you give advice without paying attention to that process, um, it's not gonna be the most insightful advice. Let me put it that way. Um, uh, another thing that I discovered is that the, how software is built actually matters. So when you're doing licensing, uh, the more conventional kind, you're doing licensing for a company software product, all that software is developed within the company. Or it may be licensed from a, you know, another company, but it's, it's, it's generally uh, sort of, from an intellectual property perspective, relatively coherent and managed. So how it's built doesn't really matter a lot to the lawyers who are licensing it, and they, they may not know much about how it's built. But with free software, it's all about how it's built. How it's built is what's interesting, actually. So uh, this plays then into how um, the licenses apply because they're gonna apply to this whole layered experience of, of things that got constructed by different people who have different <coughs> ownership interests and so forth. So anyway, so how the software is built matters. Understanding that is valuable for anybody who's doing any free software lawyering. I, you, you, I think it's, it's much more important, someone who comes into this with a pure legal analysis is gonna have a hurdle to get, a, to get across. Um, perspective shift, this, this is, um, so at, um, th there is this event maybe, that I, I'm not quite sure how to describe it, that a company needs to go through, which, is, which I'm calling here this perspective shift and maybe it's, Perhaps, okay, so I have this, if some ex exclusivity is good, the must, more must be better, right? Well, no, that's actually not the case. Um, it is far too common, especially among patents. I'm a patent attorney, by the way. Um, uh, I, I don't know, recovering, I suppose, in a certain sense. But, but I, I bring to my understanding of this stuff my patent law background and, and so patents are the right to exclude. And if you do all of your business built on this uh, work around the right to exclude, you begin to maybe internalize the importance of exclusion and because that's the value proposition that, that you're dealing with. And we, we could spend a whole day on, on whether or not that, you know, what that means and, 
and people's different views on that. But I think the important thing to realize is that um, the idea that more exclusion isn't always better is really hard for companies to understand, or at least for lawyers who are advising them and so forth. Is really, that, that is such a huge barrier to cross. So for example, at HP, there was a huge, I think ultimately a huge transition. Not, there's no one particular point you can point to, but, but the idea that, wow, this external collaboration activity that we're contributing to in this funky way, that's, that actually works. Wow, okay, yeah, that, that, that works for us. That is a huge, huge transition. And um, I, was, I spent less time in the, in the free software world in the last five years when I was at Google. I was focused on some other activities. So I sort of, you know, I've been on a long sabbatical, shall we say. I come back and, and I'm, and I'm uh, joining Red Hat and, and it's, I'm immersed in, in uh, these free software issues. So I'm wondering, well, so, okay, it's okay now, right? Everybody understands this? As I return, I'm trying to check in and find out, whoa, it's just that the frontier has moved out. I, I thought when I first got into this years ago that we'd have a few years of transition as lawyers became familiar with this different approach to how software is licensed and so forth. And um, so some companies have come to grips with that. But you know what? The frontier just keeps moving out. The, 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 the companies that don't understand this and haven't made that perspective shift, it seems like a never-ending stream. I, I, I don't know when we're going to get to the end of this. I guess that's good for me. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Um, it, okay, so another, another uh, step at, uh, at HP was this sort of from a gatekeeper to compliance move. So there is this thing, uh, Eben referred to this earlier, the open source review board concept. And um, so review, it's, a, uh, it's this idea that you would have some sort of an approval process. And that's in fact how it got launched. So its mandate was some senior manager saw some event happen that was surprising. He said, whoa, you, you, you haven't got any control over this? What the heck is going on? So we formed a review board. And, uh, but fortunately, what happened after the formation of that review board was the idea that it actually should be a, 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 a competency group, so to speak. So instead of focusing on approval, which, which of course it did, it did as kind of approval activity, um, in a sense, its role turned to one of helping the business um, accomplish its goal. So instead of being a gatekeeper and sort of slowing things down, and um, its role was one of um, how can we, you know, a, a center of excellence, so to speak, in understanding free software and help businesses successfully accomplish that. Um, and so, and anyway, so that, that was the, the, the role of the Open Source Review Board was, was an important, as again, as a center of excellence, so to speak, I, I don't know if that's the, quite the right, the right term, but center of expertise, shall we say, and how to effectively be, be a part of the open source community and so forth. Scaling uh, leads to tooling. I, I think we've, we've heard about that a, a number of times today. Um, and so as you, you build, and as HP got into this in a more complicated way, it appreciated the need to, to build tools. I could talk about that for a lot longer. Um, and then finally, it became apparent that, in a sense, what, um, the uh, open source uh, free software projects were an important partner, so to speak, to some extent, of these commercial businesses like HP. And you begin, begin to realize that although HP has, uh, is operating with its legal advice, um, these open source projects, you know, they're not getting that kind of legal advice. You know, with the, the, the company people, they can perhaps try to, try to uh, advise them, but that's really not the role of, of in-house lawyers. So uh, it became apparent that there was a need for a mechanism for providing uh, good legal advice to projects before they became huge projects, for which it was obvious that maybe they would need some support. You know, they, they need to be uh, built on a, a firm foundation. And uh, so um, I'd have to say I was early on attracted to the idea that Eben had uh, forming what ultimately then became the, the Software Freedom Law Center. So anyway, so with that, uh, on that positive note, let me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, thank you. These are the veterans. They use words like funky. So. <laughs> We must uh, be very old. It's, it's, it's late in the day. What could I say? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can win the Nobel Prize in Literature with Funky. <laughs> well, let's move on to Karen Copenhaver. I, uh, she's the Director of Intellectual Property Strategy for Linux Foundation and has many other titles, including the International Who's Who of Internet and Commerce Lawyers. Mm -hmm. So Karen, we heard about the big giants, IBM, Hewlett Packard, how they came into came to free software, each driven by their own business needs. And uh, Eben did the Stone Age work. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then oh. everybody came. Mm. And it was no longer what Scott said that there was a time when it was not uh, it, free software <laughs> was not in everything. But at the Linux Foundation, you had this experience where it became like a massive educational um, entity or a place where everybody wanted something and to be taught and there were different kind of entities and companies. Lots of um, you I, think, I think we do have like six or seven hundred companies that we touch in some way. So when you're talking about that moving, you know, that moving field. Um, or, or with the, the forefront, it's, it, there always is another company and another lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, so I first read the GPL in I think 1995 or 96, and I was doing work for IBM. I had just come back to Boston, and uh, and it was an IBM fellow who uh, I said, "This is the, well, you know all these other things are fine, but this is crazy," and um, and the IBM fellow called me back and said, "No, it's not. Let me tell you why." And it was a math library that was used all over the world mm -hmm. and had been, you know, had been debugged by everybody. And he said, "You do not want me to find another math library." And and it was and this was a fellow that we just revered as Dale Critchlow. Um, and so he made me take an, take another look. And then, you know, what I found was that all these companies, because remember, we're, we're talking about leading up to the bubble, leading up to the companies that were, you know, that, that were moving faster than light when, the, when there was a whole shift in the concept of what was risk. So, you know, it, in, the er, in this early phase, it was, oh, we were afraid of everything. Oh, you know, there's going to be copyright infringement. People were going to copy from this. People were going to do this. Oh, there was going to be this issue about this. And it was all about what was the risk. And we went through this period, this bizarre period, where uh, the risk was all in timing. If you were too late, it, your opportunity was gone. And this concept of the risk of, you know, of, of ending up using some copyrighted code that came from someplace else, you know, that, that became subservient to how quickly they could move by using these existing assets and building with this code. And, uh, and I, I've sometimes said that you know, open source was the one permanent beneficiary of the bubble. Because, because when that period was over, everybody had experienced what was possible with these assets in a way that I think might have taken another decade if we hadn't gone through this, this you know, crazy period of building, building things as fast as we possibly could. Um, but you know, I learned from all of you, and, and uh, my role did become you know, one of, of uh, talking to, com to attorneys in companies that had never read the GPL and telling them that there were attorneys at these big companies that were very sophisticated and that were comfortable with it. And let's talk about why. You know, why was IBM using it? Why was a HP using it? Because the attorneys, just drawing on their you know, legal education, were never going to get there. It really was a community effort of coming to a consensus of the value proposition. You know, just telling them to go off and to say it's safe for a lawyer to make the long list of all of the risks and problems and why you shouldn't use this, that's a very safe space for a lawyer to be. Getting them to the point that they could support the companies in using this when they didn't have you know, the mandate from the top of the company coming down saying you're going to use this, that was, you know, that was a very difficult transition. But to cut my story short, I would say, you know, one thing that Scott taught me a long time ago, and I thought it was such an interesting point, and I've carried with it, carried it with me for so long, is that, you know, uh, an open source license is actually very short. Even the GPL is very, very short. When we began, you know, writing licenses, you know, when I started writing licenses many, many years ago, we. Uh, we, we thought we actually knew what we were going to develop when we signed the agreement. 
you know, there would be these attachments and they would have a product specification and they would have, you know, a staffing plan. I did one when I was up in Burlington. It was 420 pages long with the exhibits. And we thought we knew exactly what we were going to do. And of course, two days after we did that, the whole, uh, you know, when we finally got the developers all together in the room, everything that we had put together as a product plan was stupid and <laughs> everything changed. And, you know, and it all worked out okay, but all of that time we'd put into that detail was wasted. And everybody did that. And what you did in the process was that, you know, you'd start, people would write ridiculous uh, documents that because they didn't want to, you know, put something that you might actually sign. They, they'd put this ridiculous document. And then as the people, you know, gnarled and gnarled and whittled and whittled toward the middle, then the lawyers would get to know kind of what the deal was. And by the time everybody hated each other enough to sign the document, then you were ready to go. And what Scott said is that the most important role of an open source license was as a development agreement. Was that you, you, know, you could hang it up as a placard and say, I'm gonna build something, these are the terms. We're not gonna negotiate them, we're not gonna talk about them, we're just gonna use them. And I, I have to say that that is in, I've, I've, over and over again, that's been proven true. As, as, um, as a non-negotiated, maybe we call it a constitution, but it's an enabler, it's a facilitator. We're not deciding what we're gonna do now. We're not gonna get in the way of the developers. So and you I use that document as a lawyer who facilitates community lawyers' relationship, developers' relationship, and also industry lawyers because you're at a trade association? <laughs> I, well, I'm at, I, I would say my role at the Linux Foundation, I have my folks here can tell me that if, if uh, you know, <laughs> but is, is to prevent the lawyers getting in the way. <laughs> you do that well. Yeah, I mean, because, because the lawyers can step in and still attempt to put the 400 pages in place. Mm -hmm. They can, and I'll, I'll just, I'll give you a couple of examples, you know, Every time a new company enters into the community, we go through the discussion of whether or not we're gonna sign an NDA. I mean, the commercial companies paper the world with NDAs. It's like wallpaper and packing paper. And everywhere you go, everybody signs an NDA. And just getting over that, that, that this is not confidential. And by the way, you don't want it to be confidential because you do not want your developers participating in, an, in a development effort where they're getting confidential information for everybody else. Just getting people to get over this assumption that everything has to be done under an NDA is a big education process. Yeah, Scott was just talking about it exactly oh, about it? 10 years. Yeah. The, um, the, the, the charters that we use for our projects um, are basically uh, statements of what is not there. I mean, we couldn't, we, could, we couldn't not say anything because the lawyers would assume that there's 200 pages of you know, IP policy somewhere that has you know, essential claims and all sorts of stuff. In order to communicate that we didn't have that, we had to write something simple that said, no, this is all it is. This is all it is. And we could spend months negotiating all these details, but the day the developers got together, everything that we could have, you know, thought we had figured out would probably be changed. So it's, you know, in my role right now, I would just say um, one of the things I really enjoy is, is making sure that, you know, that we as lawyers support as best we possibly can, but that we avoid impediments to progress because we have learned through the you know, the lifespan of the Linux Foundation that, you know, that it's the developers that are the secret sauce. I mean, the developers are the, the geese laying those golden eggs and we can kill it. The lawyers can easily come in and kill the magic. And it is something, it's a sacred honor for us to preserve the magic that they've made. Well, we've talked about education and the secret magic and uh, lawyers can do no harm. <laughs> I will now turn to my clients, and now Karen's remarks make me wonder whether they should tell you or not tell you whether I've killed the magic or it's still surviving. <laughs> I have been prepping them for an impassable task that there's going to be a panel, there's going to be a conference, but make a speech, just don't use any words. 
they're my clients. I care for them a lot. I really like them, but they should not be saying anything where, like Eb and I have to tell somebody else's clients, don't answer that question. But um, uh, I, these are not, they are my, this is Steve Marquez from OpenSSL and Nathan Betson from Cody, formerly XBMC and still XBMC Foundation. Um, when I when I thought and the there when we started to talk about what we actually do for clients, there was uh, going to be a conversation which was not about copyleft enforcement. So it came to my mind that I would present to you some other kind of issues that we deal with. There are many clients who pay us price zero and uh, to get on the phone and talk to other people uh, for them. Steve Marquez is a client who wants me to get on the phone and listen while he talks to other people. He's very fascinating, and uh, the great thing about my job is that uh, I can do what I would like to do and have freedom to advise my clients, and my clients have the freedom to make that magic and while they can ignore my advice also. So Steve, please throw everything we've ever talked out of the window, but I'll still stop you. <laughs> but tell us, what is this magic which is called OpenSSL? What does it do, and what do your free software lawyers do for you which your other lawyers don't do? Okay. Um, even today, uh, friends, neighbors, um, relatives have no OpenSSL. I have no idea what it is, but in this room, I think everyone probably knows, it's the world's most widely used cryptographic software implementation. It's in toys, appliances, medical devices, weapon systems, it's everywhere. Um, and of course the whole history of OpenSSL could really be divided into pre-Heartbleed and post-Heartbleed. <laughs> um, Pre-Heartbleed, uh, it was one and a half guys uh, with finger in the dike. Mo 15 years, essentially moribund. Just in, in fact, the astonishing thing is that, that one and a half guys could, could write such a, a huge piece of software, and the inevitable finally happened. During that period, uh, my role uh, is um, I, I've never written much code, and I don't write any code now for OpenSSL, and it's because my colleagues are smarter than me. And also, as an American, I found out the hard way it's very risky for an American that doesn't work for a big company to work with cryptographic software. Um, so I'm the, I'm the paper shuffler uh, for OpenSSL. And pre-Heartbleed, uh, what I did is hustled contract work. Um, lots of small contracts that brought in revenues that kept these one and a half people from starving. Uh, and in, even then, uh, needed to work with lawyers. Um, that was really before uh, I started working with the SFLC. Uh, because anytime you're doing contracts, commercial work, dealing with money, you need lawyers. Um, I've worked with over a dozen. I fired two. Um, I have to say, is I get a particular thrill out of that, firing a lawyer, but because um, there is an antagonistic kind of relationship sometimes between geeks and lawyers. But post Heartbleed, uh, we had a lot of interesting things started happening, um, and one of the biggest ones was we want to change our license. Now that is a huge undertaking, both logistically and legally, and we've actually worked uh, with Mishi and uh, uh, Eben for three years now, at least, yeah, <laughs> and, and we're still not done. Um, and the I can tell you, I've dealt with um, over 14, 15 years that I've been doing this. I've dealt with hundreds of lawyers, um, all, all the various uh, clients and donors, uh, sponsors. I've, I found out you need legal agreements with them too. That's pretty important. Almost all of them have really no clue about open source. And this room is I, you know, the self-selected exception. Um, it was definitely the case that um, we need for licensing and open source related issues that uh, having the specialized expertise of SFLC was very, was very important to us. Um, not just the relicensing, um, but also we do uh, some quasi-commercial contracts. And for all you corporate people here, I just wanna, you probably know all about this, but so OpenSSL is used everywhere. 
and you're a big company and you're using it in your entire product line and there's something it doesn't do and you would like it to do that. Um, well, you come to us and say, hey, you know, how can we make this happen? Well, sometimes, not always, sometimes money helps. People, resources. Um, TLS 1.2 was implemented that way. It was paid for by a company that said, our most cost-effective way to, to get um, TLS 1.2 is to stick with OpenSSL and support them financially to implement it for everybody. It's a win-win, okay? Um, uh, CMS, the same way. We will soon announce uh, TLS 1.3 is likewise going to be sponsored. Um, and that sponsor will announce themselves at the appropriate time. Um, but all of that involves contracts. And it is very interesting to work with attorneys in these companies that um, they've heard of open source licenses, I guess every attorney has nowadays. But unlike these gentlemen and unlike Karen, they haven't, they don't really get it. So that's a case where um, I'll use, we'll use one attorney to do all the usual business boilerplate, but when it comes to anything touching in the open source issues, then I'm running to Mishi or Rabin and saying, okay, how do we say this? How do we express this? So yeah, very, very important um, for a project is with some of the complexities that we have to have that kind of support. Do you want to talk a little bit about FIPS business? <sighs> okay. Um, She's <laughs> the, the deep sigh is because it's, she's referring to FIPS 140. Uh, it's a um, FIPS 140 validation. It's a government seal of approval. Uh, it's an abomination. It has, <laughs> it has no... You know I wanted him to talk about it. <laughs> it has no technical virtues whatsoever. You know, the validated software is less secure, worse performance, maintain, everything is, it has no redeeming virtues whatsoever, except for the fact that in certain significant markets, federal government and DOD in particular, all cryptographic software has to be FIPS validated. Now, our culture in the OpenSSL project, um, and every open source project has a different culture, but sort of our philosophy or culture is, we've always considered ourselves the pragmatic cryptographic package, cryptography for the real world. We want businesses to use our software. We want to make it easy to use. Now, I know some of you don't feel that way, but that's really not a lack of, of desire or will on our part. It's lack of resources. That's the reason we ignore your, your, pat, your pull request and stuff. Not because we wouldn't like to, but we just don't have the resources. Um, so we've, we've felt that going back 12, 13 years now, that the lack of a FIPS validated open SSL, um, you know, it, it, it was a very significant need. And at the time I was working as a consultant, my day job for DOD, and that was one of my responsibilities. It's actually how I met the rest of the open SSL team and got to know them pretty well. And we've continued to do that. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, we're, it, Many open source projects, including our competing cryptographic um, uh, uh, open source products, you know, have decided that it's not appropriate to do FIPS. Um, we uh, do it because, uh, you know, there's a, there's a strong need for it. It is a headache. There's no question about it. Is there, I don't know what more you want me to say. No, I want you to just say what you've already done. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm going to move to Nathan, who does have a law degree, Sorry. but uh, is not practicing law. I, I, hide, it. I hide it from everyone. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a real geek. <laughs> talking to him yeah, he doesn't want people to know. Uh, <clears throat> so, Nathan, I want you to talk a little bit about this unique position you find yourself and the project in. Um, unlike almost every other project I have worked with, and that's a lot of projects, MPA really likes you, mm, and yeah. CBS wants to work with you, yeah. and uh, they actually come and ask you permission for things or offer 
assistance and resources for help. Yeah. And uh, that's not usual in our community. And tell us a little bit more about that part and also this, this fascinating thing about ancillary rights which translates into trademark policy for a free software project. The expectation is that trademark rights also work exactly like copyleft licenses or other free software licenses, which is not the case. And sometimes you find one finds oneself into not traditional disputes or problems, but different kind of conundrums like the ones with eBay or Amazon or any such thing you want to talk about. Yeah. Um, uh, first, I want to start out real quick by saying it's always fan fascinating to come to this thing because I come from a group of about 35 guys who are all pretty sure they're all lawyers who know exactly how the GPL works, much better than Eben does, obviously. Um, and, and so it's interesting hearing all about compliance when on our side, compliance is the least, the least important issue possible. Um, but the, 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 the steps we got to the MPAA talking to us I think are interesting, and I think they're because of you guys to some extent, because it changed, when we started working with you guys a lot, it really changed our mindset. In 2008, um, I joined the team, and I used my real name as my username, which wasn't done at that time, because at the time, everyone on the team was terrified that they were going to get sued by Microsoft, because you know, they were writing code, it was open source, and they weren't distributing a, a compiled binary, but it was still source code that was supposed to work on an Xbox. Mm -hmm. um, I joined the team using my real name because I was joining the team for the software that was running on Windows and on Linux. And so um, I personally wasn't really involved in any of that. But still, at the time, there was this, I don't want to call it fear, but there was this definite worry that, that at, if at any moment we were contacted by a lawyer, that was the end of the project. And, and that, was, that was just how it was going to be. We were all just going to hide back in our, in our caves in Germany or the Netherlands or wherever we were from, um, and that was going to be that. Um, so, so we, we moved away, we moved away from the Xbox and we got into Linux and a lot of that fear kind of was still kind of there because there were a lot of problems, but, but the, the first time, the first time I think we, we started realizing that the law wasn't out to get us was in 2011 or so. We, we contacted you guys, your predecessor, I forget his name, um, because We'd created a foundation um, that didn't, all of the original members were no longer there because it's an open source project. Um, and we couldn't get a quorum to vote anybody in anymore. <laughs> there, were no, there was no way for us to have a board because we didn't ever have a quorum. Um, and, and at the time, it, it, it was a really amazing learning experience to discover that, that the law was really there was a set of rules, and then there was what everyone agreed what those set of rules meant. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, you know, we worked our way through that problem and rewrote all kinds of things and stole an incredible amount of stuff from Mozilla uh, and people like that in terms of legalese. Um, and sort of from there, that's, that's, sort, of, that's sort of what jump-started everything. It, it, it was when we realized that all of these big companies out there were just as terrified of lawsuits as we were <laughs> and, and didn't want to get involved in any of this. And, and I mean, all of this talk about compliance, it just refreshes that idea that, that absolutely nobody in this room or in any other room that in, that, that's involved in open source software wants to have, have a lawsuit happen. Um, and so we did a couple different things. We started reaching out to as many groups as we possibly could, specifically hardware companies that were making, uh, that were making hardware that, that we could use, that we could run on, um, and companies that were distributing video or music sources that we thought we could play for them and, and, and make them more accessible to the public. Um, and more and more people started using their real names when they sent out emails. Uh, then, uh, I forget exactly when it happened. About two years ago, the MPAA contacted us. 
and we saw the email, and we were like, okay, back to hiding in Germany, everybody. We're good. See you later. Uh, but it was, it was a crazy moment, because the, the guy from the MPAA emailed us and said, hey, love your software. Um, I see that you're having all of these problems with people misusing your trademark. Yeah. Um, and that was... Uh, th that was a, a crazy moment. He said, we see you're misusing your trademark to actively make money uh, giving away movies from the MPAA. Um, and, and, and that was... There was enough information on your website detailing your legal efforts to check that. Yeah. And why you were not the ones who were... That, and that's it. That's, I, w so we started... We, we were starting to make very public the fact that we are an open source project, so you can do with our software whatever you want. But if you do, just don't use our name if you're going to sell this software, resell this software for you know all of your nefarious purposes. Um, and that that was cool. That was a it was like a, a a a watershed moment where suddenly all of these different companies emailed us back and said, "Wow, uh, we actually thought that you were the people distributing these boxes. We had." I think this isn't. I, well, we we had a conversation at CES with uh, one of the big uh, the big companies that I'm going to avoid saying because I'm not sure if I'm not supposed to say um, where they they literally said we thought you were the people selling all of these boxes on eBay. Yeah, just use pronouns. Yeah, um, and <laughs> and it was a, it was a, it was an amazing moment having all of these conversations with all of these companies that. Five years earlier, we were pretty sure hated us and and wanted us to go back to our caves, um, uh, and so and so that that was sort of the, the 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 most I don't know the most amazing thing that came out of the SFLC. It was it was this 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 convincing us not to be as worried about basically everything to do with the law. Well, do you want to talk a little bit more about the trademark reputation dilution problem you yeah. ran into, for which yeah. I do tell you to put it out in a blog post? Sure, yeah. Again, just pronouns. <laughs> so, so, and uh, we talked about this a little bit last year. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, I mean, we're not Microsoft. We're not a company. We're, we're, we do open source software, and so we don't have any means of legally restraining people from using our software how they want to. Um, so, uh, beyond d complying with the GPL. Um, so what we've ended up doing uh, is entirely enforcing our, our will uh, through the trademark of our, uh, of our software. So, um, so the rules have become, you're welcome to use Cody in any way that you want. Um, you just have to, it, if you don't use our specific binary that we publish, then you need to rebrand it. Um, and there are a number of big companies that have actually done that. There's uh, Alienware has put out something called Hivemind. Um, uh, there are a couple others. I, that, that's the, the one that pops in my head immediately. Um, uh, and and they're, very, they're very cool about it. Uh, the, the problem that we're running into is that we are the, we're not having a lot of success with people who are much smaller organizations. You know, basically fly by the night people who, who all they want to do is download our binary, create their own build, which is, I, it's not a build. They're not, they're not building anything, as they call it a build. Um, they install various Python add-ons, um, put it on usually some kind of inexpensive device like an Amazon Fire TV stick or something, um, and then resell it on, on eBay. Um, and, and, um, we, we haven't had a ton of luck dealing with that. Um, uh, there have been companies that reached out. MPAA, for example, is one who's actually said, we'd love to work with you on this. But to some extent, their hands are also tied because they can't, I don't know, their hands are also tied because large court organizations like Amazon and, or like eBay are hard to deal with. They're just giant uh, uh, siloed organizations where if you're dealing with one group, then the other group doesn't know about it, uh, and vice versa. Um, and I actually need to, well, okay. 
Um, and uh, No, it's just that because the stuff they're selling, it facilitates piracy, and which is not what Cody wants its name to be associated with. Right. So it runs into this very tricky place, whereas a free software project, you do want your, your software to proliferate and be used by as many people as you want, but you don't want to lose your trademark rights because of naked licensing or you failed to monitor it but you don't want to go to the Louis Vuitton side of the spectrum to say, nobody ever uses my software and my name. Yep. An anecdote fits in with that. Um, yeah. I just wanted, speaking of tra trademark, um, OpenSSL, uh, I actually trademarked the OpenSSL name in the US years ago, but we're not in a position really to enforce it. It's widely ab abused, our license and the trademark. And I get, at least once a week, a call from, uh, often it'll be a drunk, who has lost money on online gambling sites. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, I get a lot of calls from people who said, oh, my, my boyfriend has put spyware on my phone. Um, I get crank letters. Um, I, I, like I got a 30-page letter from a woman, a little green man in open SSL and, and uh, CIA. <laughs> it, it, unfortunately, uh, the open SSL name is, is widely abused. In, and I get the strangest calls. The, uh, the, that one, the, I don't remember who was talking about it, but somebody was talking about the expansion of boundaries, where, where you feel like you've told everybody that you need to tell, but Scott there's, was talking there, about there that, are just yes. more people every day. One of the most the interesting- Education part. The, yeah. m the most interesting thing about the consumer side of open source software is that they don't get it at all. <laughs> they, 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 they know that it's free, um, but beyond that, they don't really know what that means. So at one point, we, we, we had pretty successfully convinced uh, some organization or another to switch, to, to stop using our trademark um, and, and use the software, rebrand, do all of the things that we wanted them to do. Um, they were still, I mean, you know, doing all the pirate stuff you can imagine. So we weren't exactly friends with them, but we were at least grateful that they had they had done all that we wanted them to do, trademark-wise. Then, then, like, in the next two or three weeks, we got hundreds of emails or forum posts or whatever from people who were angry at these people for, having not, for, for, for getting rid of our name and rebranding while still doing all of this piracy stuff because, because they thought that we didn't want them to do that because we were Cody and they were stealing our software. And that's a that's a weird it's a weird experience to have to say to somebody no no that's not, that's literally how the GPL works they aren't stealing our software they're using our software we've given it to them and also you never a dull day <laughs> especially when you offer legal services at price zero you have many clients as I do and uh, interesting stuff like this keeps happening. Um, we are working on one of the things for public education at SFLC, how ancillary rights actually work with various projects. Because as Nathan rightly said, the instinctive response usually is, this is free software. So why the trademarks should also work like the copyleft license. And I should be allowed to use the trademark as I want. Patents is a whole different story, and I will not even go there. But uh, uh, the public education we want to do, because we've learned so much of stuff, I will only use pronouns again, and uh, is to understand what are the various problems projects run into and how do these, these rights actually travel um, downstream. And they may not be exactly how you expect them to be. And that's the part of the education. Um, I think I'm going to open it for questions uh, to the floor. Questions, comments? She don't want to go home. <laughs> there will be drinks outside, so have a question and get a drink. Uh, Chris was talking earlier about FIPS. Um, oh. uh, so, Steve, you're talking earlier about FIPS compliance, um, and uh, I was, I was, when you were talking about it, I was connecting it to the prior conversation we we're having about automotive. Um, yeah, so my question is, you know, given your experience in an area, as to perhaps um, if there were to be, let's say, government oversight in the area of, let's say, a safety critical portion of an autonomous driving vehicle, 
Uh, do you see an opportunity for FIPS or common criteria to play a role in, you know, I'm, and I, I asked the question in context that I think that right. you had sort of a negative impression of FIPS, so, you know. I'm well, I, I do, frankly. I know too much about it. Um, <laughs> I, I've seen the sausage making. Um, I've, I'll make two comments, um, and one is um, I, uh, my, I drive a 17-year-old car now, but in you know, another five or 10 years, I'll need a new car. <laughs> and I don't want FIPS software in my car. And the reason that's a concern, it's not a government mandate yet. Uh, I've been getting a bunch of calls from automotive suppliers asking me about something called DRBG. It's a, it's a kind of, uh, it's a cryptographic algorithm for uh, um, a random number generation. And uh, there is a, uh, it is a kind of sort of a subset of FIPS 140 called SP800-98. And we implement that in our FIPS module, but nowhere else because it's not a particularly good cryptographic algorithm. But um, there is a, apparently an industry standard, a new requirement that uh, among, auto, apparently across the automotive industry, that uh, software in cars has to be SP898 uh, uh, compatible. And so these vendors are using the FIPS module just to get that. So we had our team meeting in Berlin a couple of weeks ago. One of the things I said is, we need to put that in regular open SSL because I don't want my next car to have FIPS software in it. Um, the other comment I want to make is uh, there was talk about how, uh, like the control tables, data tables uh, are, are copyrighted even though the software isn't, and digital signatures on software. You know, those are both ways of kind of making open software not open. FIPS 140 validation is exactly the same thing. It makes open software not open because even though you can take the source code, if you compile executable code from that, it doesn't have the magical pixie dust of government <coughs> blessing on it. So you can't use it in DOD, so it's not really open unless we do this very special open source validation. I Forgive my ignorance in this subject, but there's a big company in the northwestern United States, and I think his father was a lawyer. Does that have something to do with the huge market cap that was created out there, that dad was a good lawyer, and therefore we're going to... You're shaking your head. You're saying, no, that wasn't a factor, huh? That's I, think, I, I don't think that William H. Gates III was primarily responsible for the success of Microsoft. I think he was highly responsible for the success of the Gates Foundation, about which he cared a great deal. Anyone else? People in the room. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good.